Tradcast Express. Tradcast Express, it's Monday, August 14th, 2023. One of the most annoying and, in fact, infuriating things you will find in the land of recognize and resist punditry is that people frequently publish articles on theological topics with next to no serious documentation backing up their assertions. Of course, there are exceptions to that, but that's just the point. They're exceptions. A particularly egregious case in point is Crisis Magazine, whose editor is Eric Sammons. That's the fellow who recently published a book claiming that the Catholic Church had lost her mission. But hey, don't worry, we can reclaim it. That's an interesting take on indefectibility, isn't it? Anyway, on August 1st, 2023, Crisis Magazine published an article by the insufferable Charles Coulomb, who is described as a celebrated historian. The article is entitled Pornocracy 2, Electric Boogaloo. It's another one of those monographs that attempts to persuade the reader that there is historical precedent for what Pope Francis has been doing, lest you be tempted to think that sedevacantism might be an option. Coulomb brings up the turbulent pontificate of Pope Stephen VI, who put the corpse of his predecessor, Pope Formosus, on trial at what is known as the infamous Cadaver Synod. Among other things, Pope Stephen declared that Pope Formosus had never been a valid pope. Coulomb adds, quote, Far worse, however, was Stephen's heretical declaration that because Formosus was never pope, his sacramental ministrations, including priestly ordinations and episcopal consecrations, were invalid, unquote. So he accuses Pope Stephen VI of teaching heresy as if such a thing were possible. And this is what's so frustrating about many of these recognize and resist characters. They don't seem to grasp that if what they argue were true, then Catholicism would be false. In any case, Coulomb could have quoted St. Robert Bellarmine on the issue, but he didn't do that. Here's how Bellarmine answers the charge that Pope Stephen VI erred in a matter of faith when he commanded that the priests or bishops ordained by Pope Formosus were to be ordained again, an act that was later annulled by Pope John IX, but reapproved by Pope Sergius III. Quote, I respond, Stephen VI and Sergius III erred in a question of fact, not of law, and gave a bad example, not false doctrine. This is the history. For Moses, the Cardinal Bishop of Portus, was deposed by Pope John VIII and demoted and returned to the lay state, after which he swore that he would never return to the city or the episcopate. A little after the death of John VIII, his successor, Martin II, absolved Formosus of his careless oath and restored him to his original dignity. Not long after that, Formosus was created Pope. He lived for five years and died. Stephen VI succeeded him, who, being enkindled with great hatred against Formosus, or else unaware or not believing that he was absolved of his oath by Pope Martin, decreed publicly in a council of bishops that Formosus was never a legitimate pope and therefore all his acts were invalid. He compelled all those who had received orders from him to be ordained again, just as if they had received nothing. This deed displeased everyone, and therefore three popes in succession, Roman I, Theodore II, and especially John IX, after calling another Episcopal council, judged that Formosus was a true pope and invalidated the sentence of Stephen VI. Next, Sergius III succeeded him and imitated Stephen VI in all things. The particular question was whether Formosus was a legitimate pope. We do not deny that in such questions popes can err, and Stephen and Sergius erred in fact. Unquote. 
So keep that in mind for next time someone like Michael Voris or whoever tells you that a future pope will have to judge whether Francis was valid or not. According to St. Robert Bellarmine, the future pope's judgment on that could be wrong. But let's continue with Bellarmine. Quote, But you will object, Stephen and Sergius not only judged that for Moses was not a true pope, but even the sacred orders which he conferred were not valid. Such is a manifest error against faith. For even if for Moses was not a pope and always remained deposed and demoted, Still, because he was at one time a true bishop, and insofar as the character and power of orders cannot by any means be taken away, it is an error in faith to say that the sacred orders he conferred were not true orders. I respond, Stephen and Sergius did not publish some decree whereby they determined the orders by a demoted bishop or the orders that Formosus by name conferred after he had been demoted must be conferred again, rather they only de facto commanded them to be conferred again. Such a command proceeded not from ignorance or heresy, but from hatred against Formosus. Siegbert remarks in his chronicle for the year 803 that Stephen VI was forcefully opposed by all those who were ordained, by Formosus. Unquote. And that was St. Robert Bellarmine from his book On the Roman Pontiff, Book 4, Chapter 12. And that was the Ryan Grant translation. Well, it's too bad Sir Charles Coulomb didn't have enough time to include Bellarmine's comments on that. He is only a doctor of the church, after all. Coulomb continues with the man who was perhaps the most degenerate pope ever. John the Twelfth. Now notice I said degenerate, not non-Catholic. Pope John the Twelfth was a Catholic, but a very immoral one. That alone distinguishes him from the false Pope Francis, who is not only immoral, but much more importantly, does not even profess the true faith. Coulomb, very nonchalantly, mentions in a half-sentence that Pope John XII was deposed by the Holy Roman Emperor Otto I. And at the very end of his article, Cologne wishes that we could have another Emperor Otto who could depose Francis the way Otto I deposed Pope John XII. Well, there's just one little problem here. It is Catholic dogma that the Holy See is judged by no one. There is no authority on earth greater than that of the Pope, the Roman Pontiff. No court, no council, no cardinal, no tribunal, no bishop, no army, no one has the authority to remove a true Pope from office. In the show notes, I'm putting a link to an essay entitled The Impossibility of Judging or Deposing a True Pope which gives all the evidence in that regard, all the documentation. Let me here just give you one. The First Vatican Council in 1870 taught dogmatically, quote, And since the Roman pontiff is at the head of the universal church by the divine right of apostolic primacy, we teach and declare also that he is the supreme judge of the faithful, and that in all cases pertaining to ecclesiastical examination, recourse can be had to his judgment. Moreover, that the judgment of the apostolic see, whose authority is not surpassed, is to be disclaimed by no one, nor is anyone permitted to pass judgment on its judgment. Therefore, they stray from the straight path of truth, who affirm that it is permitted to appeal from the judgments of the Roman pontiffs to an ecumenical council as to an authority higher than the Roman pontiff." Unquote. And you can find that in Denzinger number 1830. For Charles Coulomb to assert that the temporal ruler, even if he's a monarch, such as the Holy Roman Emperor, has the authority, the ability, the right to remove the Pope, is heresy. Now, what of the claim that Pope John XII was deposed by the Emperor Otto, and, as some say, that he was followed by a Pope Leo VIII. 
Well, all we need to do here to answer Sir Coulomb is consult some pre-Vatican II Catholic history books. Church historian Father Charles Poulet, for example, is very clear in his assessment of what happened with regard to the so-called deposition of John XII. Calling Emperor Otto's Synod a pseudo-council, Father Poulet remarks, quote, It is impossible to justify a procedure of this kind because no matter how guilty John XII may have been, he was still the lawful incumbent of the Holy See, and Leo VIII was a mere antipope created by the emperor, unquote. And that's from volume one of his History of the Catholic Church, page 420. Another pre-Vatican II expert in church history, Father Fernand Mouret, writes, quote, Emperor Otto, abusing his powers and avenging himself for some act of John XII, had the Pope deposed by a synod and in his place had the Protoscrinarius Leo elected under the name of Leo VIII. But John succeeded in assembling a regular council which quashed the decisions of the assembly held by Otto. Those decisions were null for two reasons. In condemning and deposing the supreme head of the church, the pseudo-council violated the principle that the pope cannot be judged by anyone. And in electing the protoscriniarius Leo, who was not in sacred orders, it violated an ancient tradition— that the Pope must be taken from the cardinalitial clergy, that is, from the clergy attached to a church, unquote. So that was Father Fernand Mouret, History of the Catholic Church, Volume 3, page 512. And uh, the 19th century historian Father Joseph Deras notes the same thing, quote, "...whatever he might be as an individual... John the Twelfth was lawful pope. Any attempt against his spiritual authority was of right null. The Eighth General Council, which was the Fourth Council of Constantinople, had just decreed in its 21st canon, if anyone strong in secular power seek to expel the sovereign pontiff from his see, let him be anathema. Unquote. That was Father Darius, A General History of the Catholic Church, Volume 2, page 594. Concerning the Emperor's fake synod, presuming to depose Pope John, Father Darius says, quote, Their meeting was but a pseudo-council, their decrees contrary to all canon law, and the pontiff of their election, Leo VIII, could be but an anti-pope. Unquote. With regard to the status of Leo VIII, Father Mouret is likewise unmistakable, calling him an antipope whose election was an unlawful act. And he adds, quote, True, a heavy heavy responsibility falls upon the unworthy pontiff whose life had made possible the terrible charges against him. But however guilty he may have been, he was the legitimate pope, unquote. The Catholic Encyclopedia confirms all this in its entries on Popes John XII and Leo VIII. Quote, With the imperial consent, the Synod deposed John on the 4th of December and elected to replace him the protoscriniarius Leo, yet a layman. The latter received all the orders uncanonically without the proper intervals and was crowned Pope as Leo VIII. This proceeding was against the canons of the Church, and the enthroning of Leo was almost universally regarded as invalid. Unquote. In the show notes, I will link to a response to Professor Roberto de Mattei, where you can find all these quotes that I just gave you with the proper documentation. So, what do we learn from all this? Well, for one thing... Quit reading Recognize and Resist websites such as Crisis Magazine. They do not give you true pre-Vatican II Catholicism. They give you agenda-driven propaganda. If you want real Catholicism, read the actual Catholic books from before 1960, roughly, and avoid today's Catholic experts like Eric Sammons or celebrated historians 
like Charles Coulomb. Tradcast Express is a production of Novus Ordo Watch. Check us out at tradcast.org, and if you like what we're doing, please consider making a tax-deductible contribution at novusordowatch.org slash donate. Thank <laughs> you.